and welcome to a Morris Federation online event. My name is Pauline Woods Wilson. I'm president of the Morris Federation. And today we have a talk from Sue Allen, who is not a million miles away from me, and is going to talk about the uh, history of Morris dancing in Cumbria in the early 20th century. I'm going to hand over to Sue straight away. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline. And thank you for asking me to do this. That's gone on to full screen, hasn't it? Can everybody see that? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for asking me. It's a long time since I revisited this topic, which I gave as a presentation in 2017 at um, the Histories of Morris Conference in Cecil Sharp House, which subsequently became the book you see on the screen, edited by the uh, redoubtable Mike uh, he, Michael Heaney, who is on this call, and you can actually download the book from the link there. So I've revisited it and I've also added in some extra information on it. So it's really interesting to read my notes again, rediscover what I'd forgotten and actually learn some new stuff as well. Um, first of all, it says Cumbria, and I've already had somebody on Facebook saying, Cumbria is not historic county. How could this have been going on in Cumbria in the early 19th century? Well, that was my answer, really. Although it comprises these historic counties of Cumberland, Westmoreland, Lancashire north of the Sands and an area of the Yorkshire Dales, tiny pocket of that, um, it's, it's a region with a big, a long cultural coherence, largely because of that spokes of the wheel of the lakes that you see in the middle of that map, which words was this, uh, characterized as a wheel, which is the Lake District, the National Park, which is not Cumbria, but I am considering the whole of the county of Cumbria. And for pedants out there, I actually have references going back to the 19th century that actually call the whole region Cumbria. So they're trying to obviate any, oh, why is that not moving on? There we go. Uh, another map. Now you can see where Cumbria is in relation to the country for those people who might, who are geographically challenged, shall we say. Um, and I've marked on in orange all the places that I shall be mentioning in terms of there being records of Morris dancing or something similar maypole dancing in some instances. So um, I'll show the map again later, so you don't have to memorize it, but those sort of vague purple um, splodges in the middle are essentially showing you that those are the mountains of the Lake District, the, the masses of the Lake District, which is why communication between the north and south of Cumbria is always somewhat circuitous. Um, uh, but there's quite a little cluster of places along the west coast, if you look there. Oh, this isn't moving on easily. OK, I'll just have to press the touchpad. OK, and this starts because I first became involved in Morris, which was the Cotswold variety, when I was at college in London four years at the very beginning of the 70s when I used to go around folk clubs I learned concertina and I learned Morris tunes on concertina went to folk festivals and kind of hung around a lot with Hammersmith Morris men which may or may not have been a good thing but anyway it was quite an education shall we say uh, and then I came back home to Cumbria and I couldn't work out why there were no Morris dances here and if I spoke to my mother and my grandmother, what they said was, well, we did Morris dancing. Oh, Morris dancing always was at the head of the carnival procession. And they described, and my mother gave, my grandmother gave me these photographs. And she was one of the little girls, you can't see it here, one of the girls with a hat on, at the head of this procession. And she said, that's Morris dancing. And I would say, oh, no, it isn't. Um, so what? I did not understand what they were describing until I came to know more about Northwest Morris. And that came about when I helped found a Morris team, Cotswold Morris team, with my late 
ex-husband, um, which was, um, I don't know if I've got it there. No, that's, that's coming next. My later ex-husband, Ed Mycock, we formed the Carlisle Morris men who performed Cotswold. And once Frank Lee joined us, then we started doing Sword, beginning with Flamborough. And it was just at that period, the mid seventies, when women's Morris was becoming more prevalent. And we as a team anyway, visited quite a few Northwest teams. And I began to get more of an understanding that this was probably a Northwest tradition. And with my friend, Jenny Potts, who was at that point doing her research in Lancashire and formed the Rivington side, I decided, yes, yeah, thank poor Pauline putting up her hands there because she's a member of Rivington. And uh, I began to research seriously what was happening in Wickton. And I formed um, the Throstle's Nest, Morris. And that's us posing in the first picture. We were going on a, a tour to Denmark, I think. So we're posing with the men uh, of Carlisle Morris. Um, with holding up our garlands and with the men's swords attached. It's got just about a bit of everything in that photo in the Cumberland News. And as well as doing Northwest dances and the local dances, we also did some clog, some step dancing, which you see me on the left with the dark hair and the late Sally Bramhall. We're dancing um, some Lakeland step dancing. Bottom left is our team dancing out in Heskett Newmarket in the Northern Fells and doing the Wickton dance itself, which by this time I had learned. Um, but when we danced in the Wickton Carnival in the next picture, we didn't want to do the Wickton dance then because the carnival had been revived. Um, and there were now little girls doing that dance again. So we did the Blenna Hassett Garland dance in Wickton, that is. So that's Frost's Nest Morris. Sadly, no more. Uh, they packed in in the, in the um, mid 80s, I think, or late 80s. I was no longer with them by that stage. Um, and the carnival had had an absence of about almost 20 years, 10 to 20 years, when it was revived by the redoubtable sister Aquinas, who this is, who um, managed to find the person who'd last taught the dance. And that's one of the things I learnt when collecting. If you really want to get to grips with the dance, find the teacher, the last teacher, because the participants, like my mother and my grandmother, don't necessarily remember. They only remembered the chorus, for example, of the Wigton dance. Um, none of the sets, but the, as I say, Sister Aquinas contacted a lady who then was 90 and lived in Carlisle and learned the dance from her, taught it to the girls from the Roman Catholic Primary School, which these are, and they are um, leading the procession with a brass band playing always 100 pipers. Uh, and I'm so pleased she did Get, make the effort to get that dance going again because if she hadn't she wouldn't then have been able to get a team together to display to me for me to notate for me to teach the thrusters nest and I would be capable of teaching more girls again to do the dance the carnival is once again in abeyance and people keep saying oh we want the morris dances again and i keep putting up my hand and saying i can happily teach a group but i will not organize the getting of a hall sorting out who the girls are etc someone else will take that on and get a band to play the music i will teach them so hopefully that will happen but um I'll uh, come to that in a minute. So meanwhile, I went I went on researching and, and I found um, some more dances from the Women's Morris Federation, as it then was. I acquired the Keswick dance, uh, Roy Domit's uh, transcription of the Keswick dance, the Keswick road dance and the Keswick stage, dan stage dance. The stage dance being a static and more complicated version, the road dance being processional, which the Wickton dance had always been as well. So there we were armed with the Wickton dance, uh, a garland dance I collected in Blenahasset of which more anon. 
and the Keswick dance. And there's quite a bit relating to Keswick here that I do want to, con to consider. But before doing that, I'd like to look at the context. The context that these dances all began in was what is sometimes today called Merry Englandism, late 19th century. Um, the phenomenon of, of, of people dancing in carnivals and having May Queen ceremonies, May Poles, Rose Queens, wonderfully documented by Johnny Hazlitt in his books, Morris Dances and Rose Queens, which, I mean, they're phenomenal just fantastic, packed full of newspaper cuttings that he's transcribed, recording everything going on in the Northwest in the way of uh, processional dances, Rose Queens and May Queens and all the rest. Um, the 19th century saw a great upsurge of patriotic interest in all things quaint and rural. It wasn't just a Victorian thing, though it actually reached its peak in Victorian days, later Victorian days particularly, but began with what I might call romantic antiquarians at the uh, beginning of the century. Um, and, you know, this is now well documented um, as Merry Englandism by folklore scholars today. Um, and the definitive study of the the phenomenon is probably Roy Judge's 1993 paper, May Day and Morris, uh, Merry England, which in Folklore magazine, where he asserts that Merry England was an abstract literary concept deriving from the antiquarian study or an entertaining diversion at the theatre. And it does seem the early iterations um, of Morris Francis and Maples were in the theatre not the very earliest, as Mike Heaney well knows and has written about. Um, but th th this, this kind of patriotic, this harking back with nostalgia, um, they, they probably have their roots, the Morris dances, in what was performed in theatres, plays and pantomimes and in the um, pleasure gardens of London as interludes. Um, though we can't always gauge what they were like because we usually just have newspaper reports of them. Or um, Thomas Dib Dibden's production of Kenilworth, for example, in 1821, where he has eight Morris dancers dancing in a procession, uh, or a Morris dance performed in Sir Roger de Coverley, a play in the 1830s. Um, and I should at this juncture mention May Poles, which Steve Roud makes clear in his book on calendar customs, The English Year. The ribbon dance or plaited maypole has only been around for about 180 years. The older maypoles in England, in village greens across the land, were in fact tall, much taller, and would probably have been danced around on May Day, but no plaited ribbons. The plaited variety were introduced into this country again by the theatres in the early 19th century. Um, and in classic Merry England mould, as Steve says quite rightly and cynically, it was immediately billed as an old English custom, despite its any lack of any historical roots. Likewise, Ronald Hutton in Station of the Sun, Stations of the Sun notes that by the end of the 18th century, the whole face of the original Whitsun festivities was altering, it was given an institutional form by friendly societies and the like, and by the 1830s it was common for these to be paraded around in Whit Week with Maypoles, Morris and May Queens, and the two things coming together then, the theatres and the institutional, if you like, village celebrations. You might say this is an, instig this is an instance of Hobsbawm's concept of invention of tradition, but they did become very much adopted by local communities and, and instead are definitely worth studying in their own right, whether they're invented or not. Um, in Cheshire, for example, uh, it was in 1836, it was the local squire who became enthused of this tradition and erected a maypole on the green. And in 1864, there came about the first Nutsford May Day, which I'm sure 
you all know about because we have lots of dances performed there which teams in the Morris Federation now perform later became Rutz, Nutsford Royal May Day of course and spawned events very similar to it all over the northwest while in the south Darcy Ferris pageant master was organizing similar events um, from 1886 in Islington and by 1906 there was even a Merry England Society uh, doing its best to encourage May festivals. Um, and Judge notes in his a paper he gave about the Maypoles in particular that the apparent relation of Morris to the olden times gave ballet masters great freedom to explore the possibilities. And there was a fresh revival of antique and patriotic custom with Maypole and Morris very much linked in the theatre as a nostalgic recreation of dances performed in the days of Merry England. So, um, I mean, he notes in the Northwest, for example, Judge, that there was one particular dancing master. He's mentioning ballet masters in relation to the theatre, but there were dancing masters, a very strong tradition of them in Cumbria, but they were all over the country and in Lancashire, and they would develop their dances and then teach a new group of often children the same dances. Um, this conscious attempt to restore a spiritual tie between modern reality and rural past, it's of course the aspirations writ large of romanticism and also of the arts and crafts movement alongside it. And both of these things were long embedded in the Lake District, which brings us back to the lakes, but um, particularly in the characters of John Ruskin and Canon Hardwick Rawnsley, who, whoops, gone back. Back, but for, before we come to Cumbria, Whitelands College in London was a teacher training college for young ladies and sent its primary school teachers across the country. And a particular head of the college, uh, the Reverend John Fanthorpe, was a correspondent of John Ruskin, who was an art critic, um, aesthete, artist, teacher, geologist, writer. And between them, they discussed the idea of a May Queen festival. In 1881, this became a reality and uh, it became, for, and became an annual event, combining Ruskin's romantic ideas of old English customs and rituals with high Anglican tradition, which of that of the college. And it fanned the flames for the enthusiasm of May Day festivities. But um, as Judge says, it, these things were already in train, particularly in the Northwest uh, and around the country. This fanned the flames and one of the places these May Day festivals spread to was the place that Ruskin moved to. He moved to Brantwood in Coniston in the Lake District, by which time Canon Hardwick Rawnsley was vicar of Crosthwaite Church in Keswick. And it's here that um, May Day celebrations ran for about 40 years. And it was a huge celebration Though actually the instigation in the first instance was local tradesmen wanting to um, bring additional tourists and buyers of things to the town on a half day. So they held it on the half day clothing, closing day. But Rawnsley inevitably got involved and he wrote a special proclamation that the May Queen would uh, would read out at the start of the festival. She was carried through the streets. That's the market square in Keswick. You'll no doubt recognise the Moot Hall, those of you know Keswick. And then they end up in Fitz Park with their portable maypole. There you are, plaited maypole on the back of a cart taken to Fitz Park. Um, but in fact, after about 10 years, the local tradesmen got fed up of organising it and it was taken on by the by local bands of hope groups. So it became church linked and a temperance event uh, for children, most especially girls. And uh, here we see them again parading through the streets and standing there, the gent with the larger beard in the middle of that um, picture is Canon Warnsley himself. 
he was um, a remarkable character described by one of his uh, parishioners as um, the most active volcano in Europe at one stage. He was a conservationist. He was one of the founders of the National Trust. He was opposed to railways coming to the Lake District. He was a friend of Tennyson and of Beatrix Potter. He campaigned on countryside issues. He set up the Keswick School of Industrial Art with its arts and crafts roots. The Ruskin Linen School founded Keswick Cottage Hospital. Keswick School and the Museum and Art Gallery organised Jubilee bonfires on Skidder and nationwide was involved with local colleges, nation clubs and the Herdwick Sheep Breeders Association just for good measure. Um, he was um, you know, inexhaustible. He was also a writer and wrote sonnets and campaigned against alcohol and saucy postcards. Um, he described the May Day celebrations at length in one of his books, but immensely over romantically, I'm not even going to read it, in florid prose and with disingenuous, faux naive descriptions, writing as if, oh, he just happened upon this wonderful event while out visiting Keswick, rather than the fact he was actually organising the event. He even describes himself as being present in the third person. And lo and behold, of course, there was much uh, maypole dancing. This must be the pole they brought in on the cart, I'm reckoning, uh, set up on the, and that is Rawnsley with his back to the camera in the first picture, obviously instructing the girls, keeping a close eye on how they were going in Bits Park. And the inestimable Johnny Hazlitt in his books on Rose Queens and, and maypoles and Morris dancing um, has turned up some newspaper reports um, from 1895 and 1908 on the Keswick May Day. So you can find bits about them there. And as I say, the Lake District was really the epicenter of romanticism from Wordsworth onwards, or possibly even before. And one of the things that acquired a romantic makeover was the rush bear, where the rush bearing ceremonies, particularly those at Grasmere, where words were lived, of course, and at Ambleside, which was nearby. Um, and there were at least four or five other villages. There are still a few villages with do it, but it's totally unlike the men's rush carts in the Pennine villages, where there are rush carts with, pulled by teams of men. This is a very, it's the same basic origin of changing the, um, floor of the church putting fresh rushes down and made into a little ceremony but it was again those girls that we always see those emblems of simplicity and rural um, bliss that was you know the essence of romanticism and I think words it was um Canon Rawnsley's wife, I think, who designed those green costumes that the girls still wear, the Grasmere rush bearing. The bottom picture on the right is one I took just a couple of years ago. In fact, though, there's no dancing associated with it. I was just included those because of the romantic associations and how that came to influence so much. Um, I've put this map here on this one, particularly so you can just revise your places in Cumbria, because I'm now going to come on to the places where my research has revealed dances. The first of which was Temple Sowerby, when the Throstles Nest Morris were out dancing. Didn't find any actual dances, just these very, very beautiful photographs from Kate Hindle, who was the very youngest of the dancers there. She's in the middle. Of that bottom shot. Hoop dances, she called them, and the tambourine dances above. Whether you'd call these Morris or not, they're very like the fancy dances that all the dancing teachers in the Lake District taught, including those clog dances and step dances that are known as Lakeland stepping these days. But west of Carlisle, you will see Wickton and Blennerhasset of Spatria, Maryport, Workington, Whitehaven and Cockermouth. And it's those we're coming to next because we have no dances, sadly, from Temple Sowerby, though it's one of the few places in the county that there is a stone base of a maypole, uh, coincidentally. 
Cockermouth, I managed to find two people who knew about Cockermouth dances. The appeal was done by writing to the papers in good old fashioned style the days before social media. And it turned out to have been performed by two schools, Fairfield School and All Saints School, the two primary schools in, in the town. And um, Kate gave me the two pictures of the girls dressed in sort of faux Grecian costume with their cross-laced sandals. And it seems to me they, from what she said, that they would develop dances each year and they were awarded prizes. But there were only ever two schools doing these dances. The other was all saints. And since the costume's so different in the other picture, I found that photograph elsewhere. I'm assuming that's old saint. And basically it was a simple competition between the two schools. So this was a competitive Morris devising dances in a Morris style um, and who could get the best one. Um, Yes, I, I missed out talking about the Keswick dance. I'll do that now because I haven't any pictures of it because they don't exist. So while we were talking about Keswick, it was Rawnsley and Keswick May Day, I think, is where the dances were first notated. Um, they were supposed to have been in the Clive Carey manuscripts, according to Roy Dommett's notes, but subsequent uh, hunting has not found them there. But they were developed for two schools in Keswick. I'm sorry it says Cockmouth. Should I go back and show a picture of Keswick just because it's Keswick? Right, you're back in Keswick, okay. Um, and it was part of, uh, of Rawnsley's, you know, the road dance and the stage dance. Well, there's the stage. You saw the road as they were processing. Um, and it looks as though, and research has shown, that the dance was actually from Maudsley in Lancashire. A man in Maudsley moved to St John's in the Vale near Keswick. There's some debate as to whether he taught the girls of St John's in the Vale. I think he taught the girls of St John's School, which was in Keswick, and they then became part of Rawnsley's May Day ceremony. Um, but there's a very nice article in the, the Rings Morris Dancer magazine by Roy Smith in 2010, which he outlines um, a lot about the Maudsley Morris dancers who were formed by someone who'd formerly been a Leyland dancer. So essentially the Keswick dancers are descendants of Leyland, but particularly the stage dance was very much adapted for performance as a static Thing on a stage. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say about the Keswick dance. Cockermouth I've covered, sadly no notation, just those photographs and what my informant was able to tell me, which was not very much. Um, but the other dance we I should mention in passing that had a direct connection to Lancashire dances is the Alveston dance. Um, again, I, I don't have any photographs of this. Um, it was performed in the hospital parades. Um, it's mentioned in some of Johnny Hazlitt's uh, transcriptions. Um, and it was uh, 1907, troops of young girl, dancing girls from Alveston. Um, and the Flets, who wrote a book about step dancing, uh, Tom Flett and his wife Joan wrote a book about step dancing in the Lake District, mentioned it there as well. I corresponded with three different people about this dance, one of whom, an un, uh, a Morris man from Lancashire who shall remain unnamed, sent me a postcard saying, I have no information that I'm willing to pass on to instigators of women's Morris. But the other two people were much more helpful. Dan Howison, ex-Manchester Morris, and Stuart Lawrence, the late Stuart Lawrence of Furness Morris, were very helpful. And it seems the Morris dancing in Alverston only lasted a few years. And Stuart's researches revealed that a Mrs. Hayes, the daughter of a chemist, originally taught the dance to a boys team in Alverston to help liven up the hospital parade, having gone down to Lancashire, seen a dance there, noted it down and adapted it there for the Alderston team, which went on to have girls in. Um, and it lasted only until about 1908. So that's the other dance that no photographs, sorry. 
No photographs of Glenna Hassi either, but I did collect a dance from there. More than one, actually, but we only performed one. Lovely little village in which I lived at one stage. And I collected them from the delightful Hilda Lawson, who was a neighbour. She's seen there in Victorian costume, acting the part for Ierby Country Fair. But I went to see her and the, the, she was able to tell me because she was a teacher at the local primary school and had taught the dance. Another girl in the village, oh, old lady then in the village had learnt the dance and told me, oh, go and see Hilda. She used to teach it. And so I did. And it was a very memorable meeting in the middle of winter by a, a roaring open fire with her. She lived with her brother and her brother was leaning over a stick by the fire. But the reason I remember it more, more than just getting the dance notation was that Joe remembered a mummer's play and I was able to transcribe an entire mummer's play that same evening, which was the only time I've ever done it. And it was an absolute delight. Their dance, they did a tambourine dance, they did a dance with handkerchiefs, and they did, like the Wickton one, the bells were sewn on the edges of the handkerchiefs, and the girls would wear bells on their shoes or garters with bells. But they also danced with hoops, with garlands. And so what I did was take the garland version and adapt it for Frost's Nest Morris, so we had another very different um, local dance. And again, all the dancers, as in Cockermouth, performed to a brass band playing, you guessed it, a hundred pipers. Um, full circle, then back to Whitton, which I later learned when I was busily collecting photographs for a local history book of Whitton that had boys in the team as well as girls. And I was given these photographs beautiful posed studio photographs, very proudly showing off their costumes, and a mass photograph taken, I think, at Highmore Park, which was, Highmore is the mansion in Wickton, which is a big park, which the landowner who lived there freely made available for the local people to um, use for recreation. And that's where this big parade in 1911 uh, ended up and there they are posing for a mass photograph. I guess my grandmother's there, um, but I'm not sure which she is. 1911 again, you can see how many Morris dancers there are as they round the corner from the West Street, which leads to the park up, that's in the marketplace. And they're heading up to Highmore. In the picture below, they must be heading back from Highmore they'll actually know. The one below is a, a later photograph. I've just noticed the girls are wearing shorter skirts. That's a later photograph. So there the girls are, but um, I had a lot more to learn about this dance, which I'll, I'll, I'll bring about at the end, I think. I have a very few photographs from the middle of the century. The 1920s shows a maypole dance, again at High Moor where the mansion was. A local girl proudly showing off her costume in the 1940s. And the picture below of the girls dancing through the park gates in the 1950s, early 1950s. Um, I sadly don't have any pictures of the 1940s um, or my mother dancing in the 30s. But Morris dancing was certainly going on in the 1940s. Just looking at the clock, see what time it is. I'm OK. Um, and we I know about it particularly because of Melvin Bragg, lord of this parish, of course, Melvin Bragg um, of Whitton, uh, who wrote, he featured the carnival in his Place in England book. It was a novel. It was fictionalised. But he featured it because his mother in the 1940s, Ethel, she taught the dance. She, he calls her Betty in, in this novel. Betty was in charge of the dancers. There were about 30 girls dressed in white with four bells on a white handkerchief, bells on their wrists and bells round their ankles, small on grey elastic, shining like little bubbles of silver. The girls walked in pairs directly behind the band, jangling in the wind, and danced every 400 yards when the band stopped. 
The dancing was called Morris dancing, you like the next bit, but had long lost any relationship it might have had with the maypole and yip haw. The dialect and sticks of those revived original dances, which are a mixture of pedantry and Swedish drill, set to slender melodies that often shudder at the impact. No, the girls danced a very formal, very simple skipping and chain making dance nearer to a Scottish reel than to the pure source of the Morris. Oh dear Melvin, need to tell you about <laughs> Morris sources. The band accompanied them with Scottish tune. A hundred pipers. Some weeks or months beforehand, actually I think weeks, um, a handwritten notice that appeared in Harvey Messenger's window, the newsagents, will all girls between the ages of eight and fifteen who like to be in the Morris dancing please meet at the West Cumberland Farmers Building at 5.15 next Monday. That was Betty, as he calls her here, Ethel, his mother, um, advertising for dancers. Everything about it appealed to her. The dances took their place in according to age, the younger ones leading. And so it was fair. The dancing was easily learned. Most of the girls had white dresses and if not, they could easily be made because actually Ethel and a lot of the mums worked at the local clothing factory. So if anyone was too poor to have a, have a dress, they would run one up in their own time in the factory. Um, he then, last year, published his first proper memoir, and he quotes the Morris dancers again, which is great. Um, making sure that we realise they're not beery men dressed to the nines in knickerbockers and ribbons. Um, the Wickton Morris dancers, girls, generally about 10 or 11, and he reiterates the same sort of thing. Ethel, his mother, trained the girls for five weeks in the beforehand in the road leading to the West Cumberland Farmers Warehouse, a straight road for a good distance and guaranteed to be free of traffic. Um, the required costumes are easily made. And he said, in such a remote place in a working class celebration, you might have expected the dancers to be rough hewn and clumsy. Well, not sure, but um, not these dancers. They could have been maidens dancing before a medieval monarch. The dance was courtly and elegant. The contrast with the rumpety thump of the carnival could not have been greater. There were loads of dressed floats on horse-drawn trucks and on lorries. Even when I was young, it was like that. Um, a great tradition of town carnivals in West Cumbria that was revived um, from, well, from about 1920s, carnivals all over the place. Uh, I'll just finish about this, what Melvin said. It took two or three weeks to get them all into the way of it. This is how they practiced. Another fortnight for polish. The more experienced girls taught the newcomers, practicing in groups and gradually coming together. And they'd sing the song with a hundred pipers and oh, and oh, which drilled them and made the sweetest sound as it wafted over the fields. In those rehearsals, my mother walked alongside them, anxious, but quietly encouraging, picking out name to pr names to praise. I liked to go with her and watch, watch, and sometimes when there was a gap, I was put in as a substitute. So you heard it here first, Melvin Bragg as an ex-Morris dancer. Um, and he then does a nice little bit about how they appeared in the carnival, which was noisy and full of colour and light and at the front uh, they were the stars. However an ingenious and mighty the floats, however boisterous the comic characters, Carnival Day in Wickton belonged to the Morris dancers, which I think is just lovely, just lovely. So there they are in back to 1911 and I now comes to the point I had to revise all my ideas when I was Putting this paper together in 2017, I finally went back to the little local, very local paper, the Wickton Advertiser, and looked up its numbers. And to my astonishment, found that Wickton in 1911, this was not a carnival. This was nothing to do with a carnival. This was coronation celebrations for George V. And it was on a huge scale and was covered by that local newspaper for quite a few weeks and describing how the dance was got together. And 
I thought it was part of a Northwest procession. That was understandable. But it was also understandable because I have a book by uh, John Graham, which circa 1910, about Northwest dances. And John Graham came from Cumbria. And my copy of that book came from a teacher at the National School in Wickton, George Scott. So, of course, I assumed that these dances had been put together at the school from this, that they were, that they were Northwest dances. Um, but no, <laughs> um, in fact, uh, the newspaper report where they danced, they danced this processional dance, but when they stopped on the stage at the mansion at the in the park, they'd been specially trained in the Morris dances by the headmaster, Mr. McFarlane and Miss Kay Thompson. Um, and they were doing things like shepherd's hay. But the Morris dances, the rainbow dance, they did a rainbow dance and a coronation cotillion and the processional dance through the town, what we'd all were calling the Wickton Carnival dance, was choreographed by the local dancing teacher from West Cumbria called Oliver Cowper. Um, and it was so popular here, I have to say, they, the, the girls were actually employed the next week or the, uh, later in the summer to keep performing again. And Oliver Cowper uh, advertised the next year for dancing lessons in Wickton. He was very keen. He travelled around loads of dancing villages and towns who had processions. In he, but he taught all sorts of dances, all those fancy dances. But the towns that had the carnival dances, well, when you listen to the list of the towns he taught classes in, as a rule, the length and breadth of the county included Workington, Whitehaven, Cockermouth, Aspatria, Blenahasset, and Wickton. So all of our processional Morris dances in the towns that I've researched, apart from Ulverston and Keswick, were the work of a one local dancing teacher, which very much ties in with what Roy Judge said about the ballet masters of the theatre and dancing teachers in Northwest passing on these dances and keys in with my own researches to folk song in Cumbria, which is a key point is that it's a very small number of individuals who are key to the way these things pass on. Across this nest, we went on then to perform the Wickton dance. We were probably calling, we were calling it the Wickton Carnival dance then. It's difficult to call it the Wickton George V coronation procession dance. Doesn't really hang together. We went abroad to dance. That was 12 of us dancing. That, that was the most we ever had as a set. Meanwhile, the carnival in Wickton was revived with Sister Aquinas, <laughs> with a rod of iron seen, seen there again beside the girls, there, whose costume changed um, almost every year. Uh, they even wore trousers, well, a one line wore trousers. It was often decided that one line was men and the other was ladies. So pleased to say it continued, but it is no more. These are the various iterations over the years. And finally, almost finally, there's a little video to show. Um, the second point, well, the first point is what I made earlier. It's a trope. Morris dance is today a trope of Merry Englandism and, that we've had since the 19th century. Is that how we still see it? There are new versions. We've got Border Morris, Pagan Morris, Dark Morris, which is taking it in a different um slightly different direction but that is still a different Merry Englandism in my eyes I may get shot for that the second point I've just made is that a few individuals have an immense effect on the nature and spread of traditions um and that very much more research needed into new local newspaper reports I mean for 30 years I missed the very local paper that said it was a coronation procession, not a carnival, and that Oliver Cowper, whom I knew of from the Flett's book on step dancing in the Lake District, uh, he was, you know, the person who choreographed it. And also as a researcher, be aware and upfront about your own prejudices and biases. 
change his own views over time as evidence comes to light, of course. My initial bias was Morris is a Cotswold Morris dance. No, say my mother and my grandmother, it's this. You know, we, we've, we need to always, we can very easily research as it being an involved person, participation, observation. But also we need to have one part of ourselves outside and aware that we've got to bring all this to it as well. New views always change your mind when the evidence um, implies it. Always go with the evidence. And finally, you can see a Wicton non-carnival dance performed by Thrust's Nest when we um, we performed with Noel Edmonds, God bless us. It was a very short-lived, <laughs> a very short-lived quiz show called Lucky Numbers. We entered, uh, the women entered, the men joined us on the show for this um, rather odd quiz. And unfortunately, you're not going to see the rest of that because it's embarrassing. Um, but at the end, we danced. Oh, and because we were Morris dancers, they thought, I know, we'll have as our guests this week, the Yetis. So we have the Yetis joining us uh, to play for the dance. We finish off the Lucky Numbers show, but you get a glimpse of Noel, dear Noel, at the beginning. Um, quality isn't good, I warn you, visually, because it came from a very old, um, rather damaged tape. So I hand over now to Pauline. I'll stop sharing here because I think Pauline's going to share her screen. She has the video. I wish you a good night and lucky number. Tonight marks the start of BBC One's. <laughs> there you go. I could just want to make a couple of comments about um, costume there uh, and what we were doing. We danced with sticks. Some of the girl danced, the older girls in the, um, the, the very early iterations of the dance used to use sticks. We opted for sticks rather than hankies. That was perfectly in keeping with the dance. But we danced in clogs, which it was never done with. But we danced in clogs just for good audience effect, especially on a programme like that, where you get a good sound. And um, yeah, but the hats were kind of based on what the young girls wore in 1911. That's all. That's it. That's your lot. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Sue. Who, is there any questions? We'll take the applause at the end, I think. Oh, let's do the Q&A, shall we? Have you got uh, any? I haven't uh, been in chat yet. Okay. Let's have a look. Go and have a look in the chat. Stunned silence is what chat. Stunned chat. silence. Okay. In that case, we'll go straight to people with their hands up. So, David Foote. David, yes. What do you Hello like? To 
I think we've communicated at some point. I was a member of Furnace Morris for 30 years. I think I've uh, communicated with you in the past about something rather, probably about um, Mummer's plays. Um, Quite anyway, possibly, yes. Be that as it may, I'm just a bit surprised that you haven't mentioned Furnace Morris in the uh, in your talk as a as a side which was operating in 1963 and is now in its uh, 60th year. Uh, well, well said, and it's certainly an omission, but I also didn't go into Kendall Morris or Carlisle Morris or, you know, the men's teams and those revival teams. I was concentrating on what came out of the 19th century and uh, its immediate uh, antecedents, not antecedents, what goes after the other thing, the opposite. Um, I didn't consider revival sides in that way. Okay. I know you were a very early revival. I, I did have a slide in here also of a big EFDSS festival originally. I took it out um, in, uh, I think it was the 1940s, uh, where there was rapper, Cotswold, country dancing and all sorts. Uh, an EFDSS event, a big one, in the middle of the lakes with the mountains all around. I didn't want to continue with revival sides any more than Throstle's Nest, who were you know, uh, a, a descendant, that's the word. Okay, I mean, I hadn't realised that, uh, I must admit. I mean, you did mention Stuart Lawrence, who was probably- I did, one because the... I was asking him for information. Yeah. On, yeah. Off, I, I did say off Furnace, Morris, because yeah. he had information on the Ulverston dance. Yes, okay, all right, well, anyway. I'm sorry, oh. that would be a whole other talk. But yes. yeah, well done, Furnace Morris, who are still going, aren't they? They are indeed, just about hanging on, yes. Although I have now I have now left and moved down to Cambridgeshire, but uh, oh, right. anyway, thank you very much. I enjoyed that. It was interesting. Oh, very I'm interesting. Sorry for the omission. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, next up, Margaret Hunt. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep, Maggie. Can hear you. Right. I, I was very interested to hear about the. Um, uh, the involvement of schools, because in my area, Dorley, um, there are certainly old pictures of sword dancing and lots of different types of things taught in our area. Um, and we also had a carnival with carnival floats and carnival Morris troops uh, in the 80s. Um, I'm not sure when it died out, but lots and lots of Carnival Morris troops from quite a wide area, Cannock, Stafford, um, as well as our local area, uh, came to these processions and it was a big event, a big carnival event. There's been a great demise in carnivals, hasn't there? I assume you're talking about the girls carnival Morris, the, the, the wonderful what is sometimes called fluffy Morris, rather derogatorily. Is that what well, you um, some of them were fluffy Morris, but uh, they didn't all have those. No, uh, well, I don't. I, I, things. I know. What, um, I know the form of Morris you mean. Yeah, some yeah. That's the true descendant. But also yeah. the Iron Men and Seven Guilders, um, yeah. who formed in nineteen seventies, they certainly took part in the carnival as well. Yeah, and I have uh, photographs of of them in the carnival procession as well yeah so there was uh i'm just fascinated on the link with the schools yeah and we also had um sunday school demonstrations um lots of photographs of that um well, certainly the wigton dance so when you think that sharp's morris book came out bef well before well, three years was it mike heaney will know that tell me before um 1911 so you know i think the teacher at the school was using sharp's book and then oliver cowper brought in to choreograph additional stuff and make a processional dance yeah mm. but uh, it will have been down to the interests of the dance teachers in the school won't it yeah yeah. And if there wasn't a school teacher mm. that had those interests, it might not have been taught. I think but you for those that did, it was. 
I think it's important, though, what you've highlighted, though. I think it is quite true, the demise generally of carnivals. They were such a big thing in all the towns in Cumbria, particularly West Cumbria, and they are but a shadow of their former selves now. Have we lost this inclination for more community, communal uh, celebrations in that way? Interesting. Interesting questions. Mike. Mike Healy. Oh, yes. Hello. Yes. Oh, thank you, Sue, for a nice talk. And I'll certainly go and get Melvin Bragg's new book and have a look at what he has to say. <laughs> um, you're just mentioning Coper. I mean, he was teaching Morris dances certainly from 1896, I think. So, and as, in, as you know, the the family went on way into the 20th century. Well, Marion, yes, I learned I learned some clog steps from Marion, his granddaughter or yeah. great granddaughter, um, but she couldn't remember the Morris dancing. But uh, the, the main thing I was going to say was that um, you know people like Coper, they were, as you pointed out quite rightly, as, as you could say, inventing the dances or deriving them from what they knew. Uh, the one that puzzles me and slightly uncertain about is this story of Cecil Sharp meeting J.T. Southworth from Maudsley um, to teach yeah. Keswick. Um, now, it, it may well be that at that stage, Southworth had taught dancers at Keswick, but the problem is that Keswick had Morris dancers from 1892. No, it had, what, no. Oh. Yeah, they, there's an account in the um, English Lake Um it, Not Maypole dancers. No, it, says, it says Morris. Now, there's well, always a slight issue. There is. It may have said Morris and meant Maypole. They linked in people's heads. Yeah. yeah they, so, but there's certainly a report from the Lakes Visitor in 1892. That I didn't know that. Keswick, uh, uh, Morris. Keswick, Keswick Morris. And uh, and it says taught by um, someone whose name you may have come across. I haven't come across him elsewhere. W.F. Robinson, uh, supposedly taught Morris dances to the Keswick Carnival in 1892. There was a Robinson who taught clog in Workington or Cockermouth. Oh, no, Workington. Yeah, but and, and I think there are similar it's reports the in the following chat. years up, yeah, up to 1896. The thing, the thing is, at that stage, uh, Morsley hadn't even started because they only started in 1893 when Southworth was just 14 years old, I think. So although the, the other thing that slightly concerns me is that Cecil Sharp met Southworth, supposedly, yeah. um, at the railway station. Yes, eh? Why did you meet him at the railway station? Turns out Southworth was still living down in Leyland, at that, in, down in Maudsley at that time. He wasn't living in Keswick at all. He this is interesting. Uh, My information so, came from an article in the Morris Ring. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, you know, I know. That. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and Cecil Sharp certainly met Southworth in Keswick in 1911. He met him at the railway station. And uh, but as I say, Ke Southworth was living in Maudsley at the time. It was the railway. We must communicate about this. We must. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I think what I'm saying is that Keswick may have had its own original dance well before Southworth. Well, it certainly had a Maypole dance. And as you say, if it may have had a... Um, a... Yeah. So I haven't actually looked at any sort of comparison between the figures of the Keswick yeah. road dance and, um, and anything in Lancashire, to be honest. So I don't know. Yeah. But uh, then, yeah, we must communicate about that, Mike. And thank you. Yeah, but um, you know, fascinating talk and uh, I look forward to more. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Can't believe there's no more questions. Come on. <laughs> Or, or I shall pick on someone. Don's into silence. <laughs> I'm trying to see who I know here. Oh, Robert, go on. Well done. Well volunteered, Robert. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, yeah. Hi, Sue. He's in Amsterdam. No, he's not in Amsterdam. He's in Holland. Yeah. <laughs> oh, lovely to, to see, see you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. Most interesting. Um, I was very interested in the maypoles um, because in my back garden here, I have a maypole, <laughs> uh, a real one, but it's, of course, created. But I was interested more in the link with maypoles 
because uh, Friedrich Froebel, we had an exhibition in our local castle last, no, two years ago, three years ago, um, of his influence on kindergarten and play. And of course, this is at the early part of the 19th century. And one of the activities was the Maypole. Oh. And that was about 1840, 1830, yep. 1840. And you said that the Maypole came into England somewhere about that time. The plaited Maypole, not okay. the Maypole per se. Yeah, the was... shorter Maypole dance with plaited ribbons, 1830s on the London stage. That could have come from Froebel's influence because he had <laughs> plaited Maypoles. Um, oh, wow. If I can find it, I will send you a picture I have from, it's a reproduction, it's not the original Maypole, that we had at our exhibition here uh, three years ago. Unfortunately, the exhibition suffered from the massive floods here, so... Uh, um, we succeeded in saving the maypole, but uh, good on you. Yeah, that'd be great, Bob. So we'll stay in touch about <coughs> that, and I'll see you in May anyway. In May, yeah, we'll definitely be there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Who's that? Who's along there? Paul. Paul McNamara. Hello. Hi. Oh, um. Uh, I'm from uh, Wookiton. Good. Uh, and living in Whitstable now, uh, and um, I'm uh, with a side uh, called Dead Horse Morris. Yeah. And I'm interested in uh, to see if there's any more information on tunes or dances from uh, Wookiton. <laughs> So I'm glad to hear that you haven't lost your Wookiee twang. Um, well, sadly, no, because as, as I think I said, as I was looking through Whitehaven and working to, I haven't, unless the Cowpers um, in, in Workington have any archives, which with the dances written down from their grandfather who taught it to folk in Whitehaven and Workington. Uh, they're based in Whitehaven now, the Cowpers, sorry, but they originally they were in Workington. Um, and I, I think I asked Marion Cowper that way back and she said she didn't have a notation, but it's always been on my mind. I should go back and ask her daughter, Adrienne, who's now running the dancing school. So the Cowper dancing school would be the only place to be able to get any detail. I mean, you could... Troll Workington papers, the West Cumberland Times and Star, um, for early nineteenth, uh, early twentieth century to see if there are reports, but you won't get the actual dances. But it looks as though if Oliver Cowper was teaching them, then the only tune you're going to end up with is a hundred pipers. Right. <laughs> uh, I heard you mention an E.M. Robinson. Yeah, Mike, Mike mentioned that, yes, Mike Heaney mentioned that, who was also a clog teacher in, um, I think, in, in Workington. I'm not sure. That's in, if you, there's a book called, what's the Fletts book called, for anybody to chip in? I don't know whether I can find it. Um, okay, got it. Uh, there's a book called Traditional Step Dancing oh. uh, in Lakeland. And they do have photographs and details of other dances as well as step dances and umpteen pages about um, Oliver Cowper and the dancing school and some photographs. So that does turn up on eBay. I don't know whether it's still available at the moment, if you want to make a note. Okay. And also, if you look on the in-step research group, there's a whole um, website they have things on all the dancing teachers and traditions, but that's not Morris dance. That's step dancing, clog dancing. Right. Uh, you basically, it's what the dancing teachers, the Cal Oliver Cowper, would have choreographed in Workington. That's all you're going to find, I think, from Workington. And I've never oh. found it yet. All right. Uh, 
What tradition uh, do your team dance in Whitstable? Oh, um, it's uh, border, Maurice. Border. Yeah. Well, it was totally the, you know, totally different style would have been done here. Yeah. Uh, for children to do daintily in a in a carnival procession. Uh, that's just interesting what you say about the carnivals. I, I, I was once seen Maryport Carnival. Oh, it was the best carnival Maryport. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I was... Uh, I was Sir Lancelot and I uh, had Guinevere with me. Girl, <laughs> I hope she's still with yeah. you in Whitstable. What's that, sorry? And I hope she's still with you in Whitstable, your Guinevere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I remember seeing a, a side called uh, Belfagan. Yeah, Kizik. I know them, yes. There could be some people from Belfagan here, actually. There's a couple that signed up. I don't know whether they are here. Somebody's waving their hand, yes? Uh, it's good to hear they're still around. Oh, yeah, they're still around, yes. Doing a whole variety of dances, including the Wickton dance, which has moved on in its style quite a bit. All right. Anyway, that's great, Paul. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Lovely. Tina has a question. Hello. Hi, Tina. Hi. Um, thank you very much for that talk. I found it very interesting and it was nice to see David Foote because I'm a member of Furness Morris. Oh, are you? And Furness Clog as well? Furness Clog as well, yes. And um, that leads me on to the, my reason for uh, speaking up in that Furness Morris... Um, knew the Ulverston dance from Stuart Lawrence and they used to dance it in clogs and they taught it to Furness Morris who danced Northwest Morris in clogs and we used to dance it with four ladies on one side and four men on the other and uh, Stuart Lawrence always said it wasn't originally done in clogs it was shoes um, right. but we are going to revive Ulverston this year we've danced it um, for about eight or nine years now, but not for the last couple. So we are going to revive it and it will be done in shoes as opposed to clogs. But interestingly, there is another Ulverston dance that is a clog dance or step dance. I don't know which, whether it was uh, the Carlisle clog is used to do. And I don't think that's the same as the processional dance that was done in the Ulverston hospital parade. It's a different dance. It was a step dance. It was a little set clog dance done in shoes or clogs. Well, yeah. I, seem to, I seem to remember um, people saying that Stuart said that it came from a coronation of some kind. Oh, right. Oh, that's so, interesting. So, that, yeah, so there, may be, there may be some more information about that. Um, concerning the Robinsons, the step dancers. Oh, I um, think, yes, the guys... Yeah. That or end, yes. Yeah, Deb Deborah Commode has written a book called Half Cutting Clogs, and that's right. very interesting, saying about all the Robinson family, and, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of them, so it's uh, well worth looking up. I was Deborah confusing Kermode. my Robinsons, that's who I was I knew about. Uh, there was another Robin, I thought there was another Robinson in West Cumbria. In there, the might, there might well be, yes. I don't I'm know. not sure whether it was one of that family, but... but most of them, you're right, are based Grange, Ulverstone, that way, South Lakes, Newby, yeah. Backborough, Backborough, actually. Yeah. But, yeah. Yes, I have Deborah's book. Um, it's very good on uh, fancy dances, the Fletts book as well. You can see jockey dances and various hoop dances and all sorts. So oh, these oh, oh, teachers were very influential. Yeah, one of the pictures in that uh, book is uh, three lads doing a clog dance. And yeah. I was working in a nursing home at the time, and one of the night sisters I was working with, it was actually her uncle that was in one of the pictures. And she was able to give me the names of the dancers, which I've written in the book, which I thought was lovely because you've got a personal connection. How fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. 
I'm really getting into trouble for not mentioning Furness this afternoon, aren't I? No, no, you're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting to know that there is there is yeah. a dance called Overston still yeah. being done, you know, whether it's the same one or not. Well, I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah. Carlisle Cloggies, I think that do they still do it? Frank Lee will know whether they still do it or not. Hi, Frank. Yes, they do. He's sticking his thumb. Carlisle Cloggies do a version as well. Yeah. So that would be great for you to be doing it because you're in the area. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Um, Thank Dilly, what did you want? Yeah, I can just see your hand up there. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I see a few familiar faces. Thanks for your lovely talk. I'm from Westland, Step and Garland Dancers. Oh, lovely. I used <laughs> to know them in the past when I was Throstles Nesting. Yeah. But we used to dance Keswick. In fact, Good. we still do occasionally. I can't remember whether we learned it from Throstles Nest or Belle Fagan, but I think it was Russell's Nest. Right, yeah. I know yeah. we've changed it slightly, but to bring it right up to date, like mm -hmm. Margaret said, it's all up to teachers in schools. Now, I used to teach uh, country dance, Murray's dance, clog dance, you name it, in my school. And yeah. I took a version of the Keswick dance to the Brewery Dance Festival, where all the other dance teams were doing ballet, modern, tap, and we did the Keswick dance. Now, I just thought you might like that <laughs> to bring it right up to date. Well, I, I don't I just, think the rest of the dancers quite knew what had hit them. I, and we used um, a piece of music that our musicians had recorded. So um, yeah, that was just bringing it up to date. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, certainly when we learnt, the Carlisle men learnt the Flamborough dance, the initial set of swords I think we had were from a, a chap called Bill Kane, who'd been teaching kids in Carlisle those days. I just don't think we find mostly that happening these days. Well, curriculums are such that there isn't the space to do no, it. There's no time anymore. But a dance project done not so many years ago, teaching um, kids at Appleby Grammar School, rapper, went down a storm and they took their rapper dance to Europe somewhere as well. Rapper is always going to appeal, I think. But apart from that, I mean, yeah, it is difficult. We need the enthusiastic teachers. I mean, EFDSS is a huge education program, as we know. But schools these days tend to have very little time to for that. It would have to be an out of school activity. It would therefore probably have to be a member of staff. So you're down back to that thing of it being a few key individuals. And from my point of view as a historian of it all, it's fine. Once you find those key individuals, that unlocks that unlocks the door in. And we need more of those people around now. I, I went to the dance festival for 10 years and every year I took a different form of Morris. Oh, <laughs> all, yeah. all different. Some, sometimes clog, sometimes rapper. We did rapper once. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Even took the maypole, <laughs> which is... The most dangerous one of the lot. <laughs> if oh, anyone well. knows the brewery in Kendall, the big stage, we even got the big full maple up on that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I think Ma Maggie's coming in again because she wants because we're talking about schools. Uh, it it wasn't that so much. I just wanted to ask generally. Um, Dorley is part of Telford, or perhaps I should say Telford is part of Dorley because it was originally going to be Dorley Newtown. But um, I don't know whether it's just that we're close to the border, but there was a Dorley I Steadford. And um, I'm just trying to find out whether that had a link to the carnival or whether it was something separate. I wondered if anyone else had heard of I Steadford connections at all. The floor is open. Can I, can I come in on that? Hello. Hello. Do. Uh, 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 right. I Steadfords. There used to be one in Wigan, but it but it was only a church thing for um, hymns and such like. Nothing as far as I know to do with dancing. But I think there was an I Steadford movement outside of Wales uh, that wasn't uh, dance related at all, just hymns. Does that resonate with you? Nothing to do with the church, do you think? Maggie? I, I'm not sure. I've only recently turned up some more information, so I'm still researching it. But thanks for that, Peter. 
great ex great exchanging information so i love this i'm learning so much too oh, have we any more questions nobody wants to write in chat obviously anybody else for sticking their hand up Do you think we're through then, Pauline? I think we might be. So um, if everyone would like to unmute themselves and give Sue Allen a massive round of applause. So give a couple of seconds. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sue.